Trevor, thank you very much. And a huge thank you to uh, Norman Wells and colleagues for inviting me to be with you uh, this afternoon. And thank you very much for um, coming to uh, listen. Uh, the Big Ego Trip, my friends all assume that I've written an autobiography <laughs> and, uh, with, a, with a, a, a title like that. Um, well, how self-esteem ideology invaded our lives. Um, I love me. I am powerful, unlimited, certain, strong. I attract positive people and events to my life. Now, God, when he made me, he made big stuff. Um, every day, millions of people go about their lives rehearsing positive statements like these. Indeed, one study amongst the North American population found that 50% of survey respondents said that they frequently use them. Only 3% said that they never use them. Half a century ago, if somebody complained of feeling down or felt that nobody liked them, you know, that they were no good or that they didn't like themselves, a friend would probably offer advice along these lines. They'd say, don't get stuck in your old problems so much. Don't think about yourself so much. Instead of being, being a here I am kind of person, try to be a there you are person. You'll never get anywhere by contemplating your own navel. Today, the same friend would probably offer quite different <laughs> advice. You need to believe in yourself more. Stop thinking so much about other people's problems. You need to discover who you are. Be yourself. Learn to like yourself. Build up your self-esteem because you're special. You're special. We have a generation of children growing up thinking that they're special. Of course, our kids are special to us. We want our kids to know and feel and sense that they're the most wonderful people in the world to us. They're very special to us as their parents and grandparents and friends of the family. But we have a generation of kids growing up who think that they're going to be special to everybody. And of course, as we know, life has some very hard lessons in store for them. And all of this bears witness to the staggering success of the now 50-year-old self-esteem movement. It began around about the early 60s, and it's now one of the most published topics in the whole of the psychological literature. It's up there amongst the big three. And here we have the number of um, publications since the <coughs> mid-60s on this topic appearing in the psychological, the academic psychological literature. And tracking this, a little latency, but tracking this, if you look at the number of magazine periodical <laughs> articles, there's similarly been an explosion of interest. And I have a Google alert uh, that posts, uh, that, that, as you know, you can get a Google alert which will um, survey the, the world literature every day, newspaper articles and so on, looking for the terms that you flag. I'm sure you're all doing this kind of thing all, all the time. But anyway, this is what happens. And every day into my box there appears a dozen or so articles from newspapers on, you know, what, what, what's causing low self-esteem, how you can increase your self-esteem, what the problems with self-esteem are, how you can boost your self-esteem. This is a big business, the self-esteem industry. <clears throat> and of course, much of this is due to the invasion of self-esteem ideology uh, in our schools with a whole generation of cultural entrepreneurs tasked with helping teachers defend this now fragile thing a child's self-esteem. So, all must be winners, there must be no losers, all must have prizes, and competition must be discouraged. And that most precious of life skills, to fail well, mm -hmm. is something that which our children are deprived. Our churches are not immune from the reach of the movement either. 
Um, I, I was noticing a, a church branding itself recently with the slogan, you're incredible, we're here to celebrate you. Which is a sort of a, if, I, 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 you know, I'm from a Christian background myself, and uh, I think of Jesus of Nazareth stepped uh, onto the, uh, the Galilean scene with the message, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, which is, you're not as good as you think you are, but you can be part of something quite wonderful and bigger than you. Now this turns it on its head and says, you're better than you think you are, and we will bring this thing to serve you where you are to make you feel even better. And once we begin to be alert to this, we see this everywhere from the X Factor, a generation of children primed to be celebrities, longing to be special in that way, right down through our schools. And uh, I, I was invited to our uh, a children's birthday party a couple of years ago, or three or four years ago now, and uh, we played uh, Pass the Parcel. And uh, I don't know about you, when I, when I played Pass the Parcel as a kid a long time ago, um, there was only one prize in the middle, and the whole point of the game was that you tore off the paper and there was nothing there yet, and then the music started again, and then it stopped and tore off. This game, um, I noticed as I, as I sat observing was um, that the music seemed to stop strategically at each child. <laughs> and, and as they ripped off the paper, there was exactly the same little bar of chocolate. And so at the end, everyone had a prize. Mother winked and she said, we can't have losers, bad for the self-esteem, as she was moving the record player and switching it on and off. In the upside down world of self-esteem, it's not the sort of sin of pride that you take into the confessional, but the transgression of not liking myself enough, Vicar. <laughs> so we're no longer surprised when our popular culture asks, what's the greatest love, as Whitney Houston did indeed, her tragic life ended, as you remember, not long ago. One of her most popular songs was, what's the greatest love? What do you think the reply is? Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Well, the self-esteem movement. What I'd like to do over the next um, 30 minutes or so is invite you to look at this topic under three headings with me to ask these three questions. How did all this happen? What, what brought about such a huge cultural shift as that I've just described. Second, did it work? Uh, did, did it, has it had the impact, the positive benefits that, that were promised? And thirdly, uh, um, and you may be guessing my, what my answer to that one is going to be from this one, or has it caused more harm than good? Those are the three questions I'd like to invite you to um, consider with me. So, how did all of this happen? Well, it's a big story. But round about the 50s, 60s, there was a lot of excitement, just making it very simple. And bear with me as I do that, those of you that will know more about this area than, than I, but round about the 60s, that there was growing excitement <coughs> in um, psychological, mental health, and social science research in the observation of there being a, a reasonably strong link between having low self-esteem, understood as a sense of, of low self-worth, a sense um, that as a human being, I am <coughs> less than others, a consistently negative view of one's worth and value, and often linked to that, a sense of a negative view of one's competency and abilities. Um, this kind of um, phenomenon, low self-esteem, was found to be quite, quite significantly linked to a range of mental health problems, anorexia nervosa, depression, um, some of the psychoses, um, certainly too, to drug misuse, substance misuse, to low academic achievement, Children who were struggling at school seemed to have low self 
esteem and to crime and gang culture and social deviance. And so you, you can imagine the, the excitement that began to develop as people grew into that most popular of errors and traps for the unwary, which, as you'll know, is correlation equals causation. This litters the world, the history of social science research, because two things are observed to go together. One is felt to be causing the other. Um, this lecture really happens without this. This is my very own. I bring it just to be sure. Because invariably, when you get to a lecture, they bring them along and they say, but I don't think this works. And it never does. So I always bring my own. And I have my own. So there's almost a 100% correlation between having this in my hand and giving this lecture. But would you suppose that the pointer is causing me to give the lecture? I think not. Although you might think it would be quite a bit better if it, if it did, but anyway, I'm sorry, I have to stagger on with me for the time being. But the, 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 the first error that was made was that correlation equals causation. The second was this, that if low self-esteem is the problem, then boosting self-esteem is the solution. And hence, we had the birth of boosterism, the idea that if we can boost children's self-esteem by positive affirmation, by saving them from failing, by helping them rehearse positive statements, I'm special, you see, then we can protect them from this range of adverse life outcomes, the dream. Because if, if you can imagine, in moments of euphoria, people feel they've stumbled on the psychological home rail here. We've discovered just about the cause of everything. And if we can reverse this, then uh, there will be huge benefits for humankind. And that was what gave momentum to the self-esteem movement initially. This hope, somewhat naive in retrospect, but this hope that by massaging self-image in this positive way, we could improve educational outcomes, minimise family adversity, reduce the risk of substance misuse, and, and have a generation of much more mentally healthy children. And this was what lay behind the California um, um, state legislature, introducing into legislation a, a, self a, a package of measures to boost self-esteem across schools in the US. And this gave further momentum to pop psychology and popular culture and all those books that we love browsing to airport bookstores. I don't know why do we do it. We always end up in the self-help section of, of airport bookstores, don't we? I, there must be something about travelling that makes us feel insecure and go to the self-help section. But there they all are, books on how to improve your self-image and increase confidence and assertiveness and self-esteem. And truly, we had, or would have, stumbled upon the Holy Grail if this were shown to have worked. <laughs> Happily, this false science of the time, this false linkage that was made between low self-esteem and the causation of these range of adversities. Fortunately for the, for the movement, there was a, a wonderful synergy occurred at that time between the culture, between this new science and the new culture of individualism of the 60s. There was, in, in a way, the new let it all hang out, do your own thing culture, was baptised. There was an unholy amalgam of science and pop culture at the time. I don't know whether you remember, well, actually looking around, I think many of us will, you know, I certainly do, um, the 50s, um, when, when we had listened with Mother, and, and listening to the radio was a family affair uh, in which one gathered together and, and listened to the story. Now, I think the transistor is the icon of the 60s. And the transistor is the radio that you carry by itself. 
and by yourself, you see. And now the teenager said, if you imagine the teenager with his, you know, the radio against his ear in the 60s, set free from the restraint of the family in that way. And of course, this has moved on now to the zombie-like earpieces as we all sit or walk around in another world completely um, disembodied almost from a sense of place, a sense of belonging to our immediate culture. And in a way, I think the transistor was a very interesting harbinger of that process of disembodiment, disenculturation uh, in that sense. And, um, and, and so we, we have this sort of amalgam between the new science of self and the new culture of self. And so let it all hang out into the 70s. We have hippie culture, do your own thing, be yourself. And then, of course, this all mutates seamlessly into the 80s with the greed is good of Gordon Gecko. And these cultural changes were partly driven by the new science of self, which says that putting self first is good for you, you see. And that's a very interesting social narrative that I think developed. So, as I mentioned earlier, the churches usually follow a few years behind. Um, so we, we have the, the, the same sort of thing. To God, you, I'm big stuff. To God, I'm special. Jesus loves me, and all of these things are true, but it's, the, it's where the emphasis lies in religion that's interesting. And this is a very, very popular book in Christian circles, and I'm aware this isn't a particularly religious occasion, and, but, but I know that some of you would, would be interested. And, and this is actually a rather good book, I think, but it's the title I struggle with, which, again, is, is, the, is the bringing a child up to, to think of themselves as as being special. You, you want them, as I said, to, to know that they're special to you, but if, if, you, if we launch young lives onto the world thinking they're special to everybody, they're going to find that's very hard. And uh, it is rather difficult if everybody thinks they're special for anybody to be special, actually, if you think about it. You can get an upgrade now, you're special best of all. And that's the inevitable trajectory of this of this process, you see, when God made me, he was just showing off. Well, there you go. That's a t-shirt you can order on the internet in case you want one for your grandchildren. <laughs> How did it happen? What I've suggested very simply there is um, an alliance between cultural developments and uh, popular science uh, that drove each other forward in a way. Well, the question is, did it? Did all of this work? Because th these were big promises that were made, the benefits of doing this. And uh, as we turn now to this question, there are three people I'd like to mention. Roy Blaumeister, Nicholas Emler, Jennifer Twain. Roy Blaumeister, he... Um, was actually a, a, a prominent researcher in self-esteem until he himself became disenchanted with, with the promises that had been made. And he was commissioned by the American Psychological Association to carry out a major review on this, which he published in, in the early 2000s. Um, and that's one of the, um, the, the monumental or seminal reviews of the whole area. In this country, Nicholas Emler from the uh, LSE carried out a similar review for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. And Jennifer Twain, you may have seen her book on the rise of narcissism uh, recently. And these are just three of the authors who have begun to look rather more seriously at the question, is any of this working? Is there any evidence that it's producing the benefits that were promised. Well, the first point that Roy Blymaster makes is that, well, we certainly are more glorious in our own eyes. If you look at tracking studies of what young people say about themselves, 
Uh, people are much more ready to use self-affirming statements like, I am an important person, over time. And um, uh, we see here American students who rate their abilities above average has steadily grown over the 60s to 2010. The leadership ability, they rate themselves as, sorry, this one's leadership ability has been improving. Their social self-confidence, this one here, they rate them. Everybody sees themselves as getting better in this way. So, so the way our self-image is improving. But there have been a number of psychological studies which say, if you come at this objectively and ask people's friends what they think about some of these ratings, there's quite a discrepancy there. And it's much harder to see the benefits objectively as they're subjectively. But people are certainly ready to endorse much more positive statements about themselves. So that was the first conclusion that Nicholas, uh, the Roy Blaumeister reached. And Nicholas Emler and he then both agreed on the next conclusion, which there's no evidence that boosterism, as I'm calling it, this boosting one's self-image, delivers any, any of the health, educational, or social outcomes claimed. There's simply no evidence of that reality. And anyway, as, as another psychologist, Jennifer Crocker, points out, unconditional self-esteem is very difficult to achieve. By that, she means that the notion that I can think of myself as a person of great value and worth, independent or independently of what I'm achieving, how I'm doing, where I sit culturally and socially, who I am, it's very difficult to somehow tear our sense of self-worth away from those things and as a standalone entity that's somehow impervious to the rest of my life, unconditional self-esteem. By the way, if, if you do want to um, uh, download these slides, I'll, I'll put at the end a website where you can just click and download them from so that you've, you've got them. I'll break for questions in a minute, but I want to tell you about this study here. This was carried out uh, about um, seven years ago now at uh, the University of um, uh, Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, and this is a randomised controlled trial. And what they did was they took a sample of people and they randomised them to one of three groups. If you fell into group A, you were given lots of little cards with statements just like those that we started this talk with. You're special. I attract people to myself now. I'm positive today. Today is going to be a day of perfection and achievement. I have a magnetic attraction on people. Things, sort of stuff you sort of think all, all the time and imagine. <laughs> but um, they, they were told to have a sort of a meditative period, set aside 20, 30 minutes every day, and meditate on these cards and make them true of themselves, to, to appropriate these statements, to, to adopt them for themselves. All right? Positive thinking. This group, the middle group, group B, if you fell into this group, you were told, you were given the same cards, and you were told to have the same period of meditation, but what you had to do was look at each card and say, how is this true of me, and how is this not true of me? Okay? And um, the third group were, were, were given the cards, but with no instructions at all as to what to do. So, um, how did these three groups fare? The authors say, actually, when they start the study, considering the scale and impact of the self-esteem movement, it is extraordinary that there have been so little of this kind of really careful evaluation in properly controlled trials, first of all. But what did they actually find? Well, 
that they found that people who went into the study, whatever group they fell into, people who went into the study with, with high self-esteem, if they went, fell into this group, they felt marginally even better about themselves by the end. Okay? But the people who went in with low self-esteem, a low sense of self-worth, who fell into this group, at the end of the study period, actually felt worse. And the conclusion was that these kind of positive self-statements may um, benefit some, i.e. people who already have a rather rosy view of themselves, but, quote, backfire for the very people who need them most. Why do they backfire? Because it's hard to believe your own propaganda, especially if you've got low self-worth. And I think that study just exposes the poverty, the thinness of this kind of thinking which so permeates our culture. So um, what I'd like to go on to just before we break for a few questions, because I'd love to hear whether you've got some wisdom or thoughts on this chip in, and then I'll return to the final section. But does this cause more harm than good? Well, the, the, the last study that I mentioned suggested it, it might well, if, if it's making people feel worse at the end of that time. Um, because um, although we, we can't be sure that um, low self-esteem is the cause of, say, depression and other uh, mental health problems, it certainly doesn't help. And remaining entrenched with a very consistently negative view of oneself isn't something that one would want to nurture and maintain. What I'm quarrelling with is whether the way out of that is these positive self-statements, or whether we really can protect ourselves with positive self-statements. But I'm not suggesting for a moment that having low self-worth, telling, talking ourselves down in this way is a good thing. It, it, it's not. So might it be doing more harm than good to be, to be rehearsing these positive statements to ourselves? Well, there are three things. There are three ways in which this culture of self-esteem, I think, does cause harm. First, it leads to not trying hard enough. It, in, it actually impairs learning and growth. What do I mean by that? Well, um, a few years ago, um, I used to go on a, a conference, and we would, at the end of the conference, a little group of us, go skiing, because happily for us, the conference was in Switzerland. And, uh, and we had a great group of friends, we were about roughly the same level, uh, and we spent just two or three days um, uh, going around the slopes. And those of you that have skied, um, you, you'll understand what I mean when being by myself as opposed to being with my family, it all seemed incredibly cheap, you know? Just one cup of coffee. Or, or if you did buy a round, then somebody else brought a round and one ski hire. And it also, as opposed to taking your children on the, on the slopes, which as you'll know is a rather expensive affair. So not only was this great fun, but it was also very cheap. So that, that, was, that was quite, quite heartening. But we, we were not bad. I, I mean, we weren't quite, quite up to the standard of, of these chaps here. But I want to tell you a story because one day um, we were just stuck having a bit of a rest like this and down through the virgin snow, because we'd had a lot of snow overnight, were some very keen looking skiers swooshing down through the off-piste. I never go off-piste, very dangerous. But uh, they were swooshing down and one or two of them had helmets on. I mean everybody has helmets now, but in those days you were very keen if you had a helmet on. And they drew up to a halt beside us. And one of the, uh, the guys I recognised, a friend from the conference, another professor, actually, in psychiatry somewhere. And he said, Glenn, come, come join us. We're going off. We've got a guide. It's going to be great fun. And uh, I thought for a, a, a microsecond. And then said, no, 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 it's all right. Thank you, Sean. You, you, you guys just... 
go, you know, go on your way. And, and off they went, looking very professional and very smooth and cool and swish. And we were left standing. And one of our group said, it's interesting, isn't it? He said, Glyn would rather be the best in this group than the average in that. <laughs> Which I thought was an interesting sort of observation for a pathologist who was a pathologist himself. There wasn't even a psychiatrist. That, that was what really, really made it sore. But um, he, he, was, he made a very interesting observation you see, that if, if, you all, if you've acquired a certain position, a certain view of yourself, which is positive, particularly in comparison to others, if you think you're a prince, it's very hard to discover that you're a frog. And so you become risk averse. You don't take risks. You protect yourself from competition. You avoid opportunities efforts. And this, many of you know the work of um, Carol Dweck, who's written a wonderful book called Mindset. And Carol Dweck is a psychologist in the States who's carried out a lot of interesting, quite carefully controlled psychoeducational evaluations here. And her point is that if you raise children to think of themselves in fixed ways, particularly in terms of status. I am an intelligent person. I am a special person. I am a clever person, you see. We create exactly that phenomenon of risk aversion because you don't want to disprove what you've come to believe about yourself. And we brought up a generation of children, you see. We say, what are we here, a little Mozart in the making, or what? You say, you think you're a Mozart. Um, that you're intelligent. You know, you're a very, very special little boy. Intelligent. And uh, she says, the, the problem with that is, is that we set our kids up to fear failure. And she did some nice work. Uh, let me tell you about one of her studies. She took a, a cohort of children and uh, she gave them a, a rather simple test that this is the sort of dirty trick that psychologists play on us, isn't it? But she gave them a rather simple test um, and half of the children, and they all did well on it, half of the children, the, the teachers were primed to say, you know, you're really intelligent, you, you've got a gift at this kind of, this kind of activity. Um, you keep going, that's, you, you know, you're, you're really quite special at this. And the other half were told, you worked at that. I liked the effort you put in. You know, it wasn't easy. You rolled up your sleeves, you gave it a try. And, you know, it's great when we try. We don't always succeed, but it's great trying, isn't it? Do you see the difference in approach? One is um, nurturing the kid's status. The other is endorsing, praising their effort. And then the next stage of the experiment went like this. All of the children were given a choice for the next test. And basically, they were given the choice of an easy test or a hard test. And you can guess where I'm going with this, because the children who'd been um, nurtured in the fixed mindset chose the easier tests. The children who'd been praised for the effort chose the harder tests. On average, these were just statistically out differences between the group. But she has Carol Dweck, if you D W E C K E, mindset is her book, and it's a very easy to read book, and she's replicated these kind of uh, investigations over and over. How to praise your kids. Sorry, there's no E on the end. D W E. CK. She, she says there's praise for what you possess. You know, you, you're intel you've got intelligence, you're an intelligent person. It focuses on evaluation of the self. You're smart. And that leads to a risk aversion, unless success is guaranteed. Instead, she says praise for what you do and the effort you make. You really worked well at that. Well done. Okay, that was difficult. 
But you know, a lot of people don't get it right first time. Let's see if we can come at that a different way. Will, can you go that first? Oh, come on, let, I like the way you don't give up. See, it's a very different kind of praise to what a special little kid you are. And the growth mindset, as she calls it, leads children to respond positively to the risk of failure and to take those risks. So the first negative impact of, of the self-esteem movement and this false positivity, boosterism, as I call it, has, has been amongst our children um, effort avoidance, not trying hard enough. The, the second, I said there were three things, the second negative outcome is the opposite. It's trying too hard. It, it, it's, it's trying to be that person your mother said that you were, the special little boy that you were brought up to be, the lovely little princess that they had on the car on the triangle. Danger, princess on board, you know? And, and of course, as somebody said, if you bring your children up to think they're a princess, that makes you their loyal servant, doesn't it? <laughs> but but if, if, if we're brought up to be this, rather than being risk averse, it can have the opposite effect with others, and it can drive them into a relentless, endless treadmill of trying to make that true in my life. Who's this? Who is it? Johnny Wilkinson. And you remember on the 27th of November 2003, 26 seconds before the end of that great World Cup match, he scored the drop goal for England. And in a moment, everything that little boy had worked for all his life, since he stepped out on to the field when he was eight, eight everything he headed for had come to fruition or so it seemed. And as you remember, overnight he was a kind of a national treasure. And he was paraded through the streets of London and wheeled in to see the Queen and even better taken in to see Tony Blair. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and generally fettered. And yet in his book, Tackling Life, he says of that kick, he says within hours, not, not days, not weeks, within hours of that kick, I was tumbling out of control. You see, I'm only as good as my last kick. I'm afflicted with a powerful fear of failure, and I didn't know how to free myself from it. And if you, if, if, if our response to that is, um, you, you're special, you've got to think of yourself positively, the, the, the problem for many people is it simply drives them back onto the treadmill because the, they do the great kick, which in many ways realizes that dream, that promise of them. But as we know, we're only as good as the last kick. We're only as good as the last thing we did or the last thing got. I mean, for example, you can get one of these high heels children shoes promise self-esteem boost draws criticism from parents and doctors bled the headline of the daily mail high heels children now these are very interesting little shoes because they don't look as if they're built up do they but but the genius of these shoes is that you can raise your child's sense of self-confidence so it's said by getting them a pair of shoes and the other children don't know that they're walking taller because literally they are taller. Which is great, isn't it? Until everybody else gets a pair of shoes and then you're just walking the same <coughs> as they are. And it's a bit like, uh, you know, going down uh, in, with an SUV down High Street in Kensington. You know, it's wonderful sitting above everybody else because you can see it all the other cars until everybody else has got a, a Land Rover and you're just now clogging up the road with them. Only as good as my last kick, my last pair of shoes, the last bracelet, the last thing I got, the last Facebook 
what do we call Facebook? Updates, don't we? We update ourselves. Um, <coughs> and we could talk about the whole internet, virtual world, as uh, an, an opportunity to endlessly reinvent ourselves and present ourselves to the world, trying too much, trying too hard. What's the third thing? So, not trying hard, not trying too hard. The third thing is increased narcissism. In the early 50s, 12% of teens agreed with the statement, I am an important person. By the late 1980s, an incredible 80% agreed with this statement. This is Jean Twain, and this is a psychologist who has tracked data over several decades and shows here that self-esteem has indeed been going up between 1970 and 1995. Over that time, this is amongst male college students in the US, large samples. And over the same period, these are narcissism scores on a scale administered to measure narcissism, the preoccupation with the self the filtering of the experiences of life through the big question, how does this make me look? How does this make me feel? Narcissism. Now, I hope you're all thinking, but hang on a minute, correlation doesn't equal causation, because that's all I'm doing here. I'm giving you a correlation. But nevertheless, I can't prove that the one causes the other. But I think at the level of there being a plausible, a plausible case there, there's something certainly to worry about. So, not only has this great social, cultural movement and educational movement, I believe, spectacularly succeeded in altering our mindset, but it spectacularly failed in delivering any of the goods that it promised, and risks indeed undermining confidence, increasing drivenness, making our children more risk averse, as one of its, uh, as among its undesired consequences. So what I'd like to finish with is is some my own thoughts, but you have yours, and and in place of self esteem, and I've just got two brief things. I think we need to encourage a rounded self-concept rather than a, a self-concept that's rooted in worth. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, it, it's simply that it's hard to know what you're worth when you don't know what you're for or who you are. A sense of self that's broader, more rounded and deeply rooted than the one question of what am I worth? We, we picked out what am I worth. I, I don't think you can uncouple that from that deeper philosophical question of what am I for? And who am I? And what am I here to do? And what can I contribute as much as what can I get? And so we, we, we need, I think, with our children and then in our own hearts and minds to encourage a rounded self-concept that isn't all about my self-worth, but self-worth is part of that. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But then the second suggestion is we need to think about building resilience and character virtues in our children. And part of that, again, will be a sense of worth and value of the self. But again, it's part of a larger story of bounce back and being able to make a contribution and overcome failures and make an effort and work in a team as well as individually. And all of those other aspects of resilience. And I'm pleased to say a lot of schools are abandoning their self-esteem policies. You know, schools have whole school self-esteem policies. Um, and many are and, and introduced of the concept of resilience, which is much better, I think, resilience teaching and training. But going back to this encouraging around itself concept, um, you see what what we have what happened with the self-esteem movement ideology was 
we discovered we were getting the work of amateur philosophers when we expected the work of professional psychologists. That's what this was all about. It was amateur philosophy. It was asserting your worth without asking the harder philosophical question that underpins it. But why? On what basis am I a worthy, valuable, special person? What's the world view that that sits in? Alastair McIntyre, the moral philosopher, makes this point. He says it's hard to know the worth of a thing if you don't know its purpose. And he, he gives the example of a, a screwdriver. He says if a Martian lands and you show them a screwdriver and you say this is a very important thing, it's great value, they look at it, they have no way of assessing what its value is. So you say, how much do you think that's worth? They have no idea. They won't know what, it's just a piece of metal sticking out a piece of plastic. They have no clue. But then when you show them a screw and you show them how the, the car is pinned together, is held together with this thing, once they can see what it's for, now they have a sense of what it's worth, you see. And so we, 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 we can't separate worth from these deeper philosophical issues of purpose and meaning and philosophy of life. And of course, uh, there, there's others that do have a, a religious world view, which, which I think you, you were getting at here, would, would know that, um, that, for example, the Christian world view pivots around the idea that we are not we haven't been um, stranded alone in the universe to make ourselves up, that, um, that, that, that God reveals himself to us. But he not only reveals who he is, but he reveals who we are. And so the great magisterial opening of John's Gospel, um, as many as received him, to them gave he the right, the greatest human right of all time, to become children of God. And so, as the philosopher Alan Ricoeur says, God speaks our identity to us. And so our sense of self is contextualised in the revelation of God. This is who I am. And now I have a basis for beginning to unpack what I'm worth. And what I discover is that in the love of God, and in God's passion for me, I have great value. But not simply value, I have purpose. And it's a purpose that's rooted not in my individual merits and destiny and worth, but in something bigger than me. It gives me a, a story of which I'm a part, rather than of which I'm the centre. Now, you don't have to be a Christian, I think, to have a philosophy of life that works in this way. Humanism can similarly develop, help one develop a self-concept in which one can find a sense of worth and purpose. Um, the psychologist Jennifer Crocker talks about ecology as providing, for many people, a sense of being part of something bigger than they are and working to it. But the important thing, she says, is not to be ego-absorbed, but she calls it eco-absorbed, part of a bigger picture, you see, in which I find a, a sense of purpose place and meaning and, and these are the factors to which my sense of value is woven and kept in its place and so I, I, I do think that, that this question of philosophy of life is, is a wonderful gift that we can give our children a way of thinking about myself, why I'm here we mustn't leave our kids to make themselves up as they go along and that's being loved, meaning, and a sense of purpose. That is the basis of resilience, I think. It's when we have a meaning, we have the strength to bounce back. When we have a purpose, we have the persistence to keep going. And when we were loved by our parents, but then ultimately, many of us weren't all that loved by our parents. Many kids out there, three million, with only one parent, and they loved hugely by that one parent, but three million without a dad, maybe, most of them single parents. Um, without this foundation of 
being loved. Uh, uh, of course, what what those with a theistic worldview have is a sense of being loved by somebody who isn't tethered to their own parental background in this way, but transcends it. And so these are the foundations of self-worth. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I am going to stop, Trevor, I'm sorry. Um, humbly, I've got a website, humbly named glennharrison.com. Um, <laughs> Um, and you can download the slides from Monday. I'll, I'll lock them there if, if you want it. And I'll put one of the references to Gene Twain, Crocker, and one or two of the other people I've cited will be on that as well. So if you go Monday, that's, that's the book. It is written from a Christian point of view. That's a health warning in case you, you, that, that, you find that hard. But uh, that's the book where many of these arguments I've tried to unpack and rehearse the popular. Level Trevor, thank you. Sorry for going. No, thank you.